business student around the world, we will eventually become part of an organization with colleagues of different education, personalities, and lifestyles. Due to the nature of human beings, there is an inevitable process known as conflict that threatens the relationship and productivity of the workplace. Together, we can educate each other and act accordingly so that we maintain a healthy work environment for everybody. By the end of this video, you will become educated and aware about what conflict is, why it is important, and what we can do about it. Let's begin. Conflict is defined as a process in which one party perceives that its interests are being opposed or negatively affected by the other party. To put into simpler terms, one person believes that another person's efforts are obstructing or getting in the way of their own. Why is conflict important to address? Why does it even matter? It goes away on its own, right? Not so fast. According to statistics, CPP Incorporated, approximately 85% of employees experience some kind of conflict. Whether it is because of heavy workload, personal attacks, workplace stress, or influences of senior management, conflict decreases productivity and leads to job dissatisfaction. With the right education, increased awareness, conflict is a process that we as rational human beings can do something about. Let's look at an example, shall we? Hi everyone, I'm glad you can make it today. My name is Denise and I'm the Human Resources Director for a global contracting company. I'm in the middle of a workplace conflict and it would be beneficial for you all to see what conflict can do to any workplace if you end up in it. Here we have Louie and Karen. Both are managers of different but similar departments. As equals, they semi-often reach out to one another for assistance, info, advice, and so forth, just like leaders of management should. It is the end of quarter four. Karen is faced with a looming deadline and tons of work. She reaches out to Louie for assistance. Louie, faced with deadlines himself, goes beyond his job description to assist Karen with her deadline and work. Being civil, Louis remains cooperative and gave Karen above and beyond support to complete the quarter four project. In the end, any crises are avoided. Pay attention, folks, because this is where things get complicated. Shortly after the first quarter begins, the senior executives pull Karen into a conference with all of the managers, including Louis. Pleased with a high quality report from quarter four, they begin talking to Karen about how impressive, accurate, and amazing it was. Before the conference ended, the executives announced that Karen's hard work earned her a promotion to director, which includes a raise and director's bonuses every year. Karen thanks everyone for their recognition and happily accepts the promotion. Louis sees all of this and is enraged. Not only was this a promotion that Louis was also in the running for, but no credit was given to him for the completion of Karen's quarter four reports, despite her inability and time management. How could she leave me out in the cold and fail to mention the hours of work I put in to help her? After the promotion, Karen's behavior begins to change towards Louis. She would start ignoring him in the hallways and avoid any interaction, including their usual Friday lunch. In monthly budget meetings, Karen now prioritizes company budgets and labor towards her own department, leaving Louis's department with less resources and less time for productivity. Louis needs to take initiative and address his concerns with Karen before the conflict worsens. The best choice of conflict resolution is through the process known as negotiation. Now that I have explained the current dynamics between Louis and Karen, my fellow HR managers are going to recommend what Louis can do to improve the tensions between them. Thank you, Denise. In the business environment, negotiation is the process whereby two or more conflicting parties attempt to resolve their divergent goals by redefining the terms of their interdependence. Believe it or not, we negotiate every single day. But it is evident in the workplace merely because coworkers are normally interdependent with one another on all levels to get a job done. As business students, it's essential you all understand how to resolve workplace conflict through any appropriate means of negotiation. Now let's look, dig a little deeper. And Louis has two different approaches to viewing their potential conflict negotiation, the distributive or in integrative approach. The distributive approach, also known as win-lose approach, causes the potential negotiator to believe that one party necessarily loses while the other party gains. People with this mindset negotiate so they avoid less loss than the others who are negotiating. Louis could see this conflict through the distributive approach where he sees Karen being the winner from her prioritizing the company's budget towards her department. This leaves Louis thinking of himself as a loser. This can lead to disastrous outcomes for the company, create company politics, and decrease productivity, and even lead to turnover. Now let's look at the alternative and healthier approach to negotiation. The integrative approach, also known as win-win orientation, allows for mutual gains where negotiators believe that the resources are expandable rather than fixed if both parties work creatively to find a solution. Louis can use this conflict as an opportunity to improve their workplace relationship as well as to allow for better budget planning for his department. When you are looking at your own conflicts in the workplace, it's important that you all begin with a cautious integrative approach in order to avoid creating more conflict from the competitive tendencies of distributive problem solvers. 
Now that we have won over the distributive and integrative approaches, our integrative approach needs some preparation, as any negotiation should. Here, Curry will discuss what it means. Thank you, HR Manager One. Now, for Louis to walk up to his superior and uh, confront her about the issues he's been having can be risky, depending on how he handles the situation. This is why taking time to prepare for negotiation is essential for successful negotiations. Now, let's begin with Louis' case. Louis wants the credit he deserves for helping Karen during difficult times. It wasn't the fact that the credit and the promotion was given to Karen, but her attitudes towards Louis has changed due to her now giving superiority. Louis needs to understand his needs and develop goals. Louis needs to develop his goals so that he achieves the right outcome from his exchange with Karen. It reflects what needs Louis is trying to fulfill from the goals himself. It is important to remind yourself that you need to focus on your needs. And do not lock into fixed goals. Why? Because effective negotiators try to understand their own needs and actively consider different proposals and opportunities, some of which can actually fulfill his or her needs better than his or her original goals. With Louis, he needs to identify three key positions. Number one, what he will initially request in the negotiation, and two. What he would want to achieve in the best possible situation, and three, what minimal acceptable results he would be willing to accept. With these three positions in mind, Louis decides to come up with three goals that we would want to get get out of his meeting with Karen. It was what we are going to call the three R's: recognition, respect, and reward. But what about Karen? She knows what she did with Louis would lead to conflict. As upper level management, she is going to have an agenda herself on what she is going to get out of the meeting with Louis. With a rattle manager like Louis, her goals are going to have to re- revolve around cooperation and flexibility. If she is going to have a successful outcome from their steam conflict, all right. Now that Louis has developed her needs and developed goals for her meeting with Karen. He schedules a meeting with her for the end of the week, but it's not as easy as it seems. Here we have HR manager three and an HR manager four ready to talk about how important this negotiating setting is, as well as important aspects to remember about gender and the negotiation. Take it away. Thank you, Curry. So why should Louis care about the negotiation setting? Well, the effectiveness of his negotiation depends to some extent on the environment in which the negotiations occur. If Louis is extremely frustrated, do you think it would be better to do it in his cubicle in front of his supervisors, or have it in a priva- private office setting that allows privacy and minimizes miscommunication from interpretations of others? However, considering the strategic benefits of meeting on on his home turf, having it in a neutral setting like the conference room is the best choice. Another factor to take into account is this: Is Louis meeting with Karen over the phone? Skype or in person, the physical setting in which negotiations are held do matter in terms of influencing orientation. For the sake of effectiveness, Louis arranges to meet in person with Karen in the conference room. Sometimes people who sit face to face can develop a distributive win lose approach. However, Louis is going to strategically su- suggest both face a whiteboard so they can brainstorm and resolve their conflicts, needs, and solutions. This reflects the notion that both Louis and Karen face the same problem and issue, and can work together to resolve their conflict. A final factor that needs to be taken into consideration is: Will there be an audience when the negotiations occur? Will the CEO be there? Fellow department managers, human resources. In most cases, negotiations have audiences when there is a vested interest in the negotiation outcomes. When the audience. Has direct surveillance over the proceedings. The negotiations tend to be more competitive, less willing to make concessions, and more likely to engage in assertive tactics against the other party. Since no one has a vested interest in the negotiation outcomes between Louis and Karen's personal conflict, no one else should be present. However, while the negotiation setting serves important value to consider here, Adrian will talk about gender and negotiation in the workplace. Thank you tonight.
Gender negotiation is vital to understand, as there are basic gender differences in negotiation that lead to various outcomes depending on gender. For example, when it comes to negotiations, women tend to have poorer economic outcomes than do men. Women tend to set lower personal target points and are more likely to accept offers just a little bit above the resistance points. Men differ, as they set higher target points and push and push to get a deal as close to their target point as possible. It is important to take note of gender influences in conflict management because women will give higher priority than men to interpersonal relations in the exchange. However, Karen's rash behavior can be a result from previous negotiations she's had where she was treated worse than her colleagues. This isn't just a one-time situation or just an unqualified assumption. Reports have shown that female negotiators have a significantly higher risk than men of being deceived by the other party and have less generous offers than their male counterparts. Despite Karen's behavior, it is important to look at why genders may play an important role and may be important for Louis to take note before negotiating with Karen. Now, we have Paulina to talk about the negotiation process and the bargaining. Thank you, Adrian. Now, as you have seen, negotiating is not a cakewalk. The negotiation process is a complex human interaction that includes various concepts, whether you think of perceptions, attitudes, motivation, decision-making, or communication. However, the important specific negotiation practice are to gather information, manage concessions, manage time, and build the relationship. Let's dig a little deeper into this. The first step is to gather information. Information is the cornerstone of effective negotiations. Successful negotiations require both parties to volunteer information. However, information sharing is a potential pitfall because it gives the other party more power to lavish a better deal if the opportunity occurs. Skill negotiators address this dilemma by adopting a cautious problem-solving style at the outset. They begin by sharing information slowly and determine whether the other side will reciprocate. In this way, they try to establish trust with the other party. However, it is not just about sharing information. It is also about listening. A famous saying is, seek first to understand, then to be understood. In this case, Karen and Louis both have the responsibility to give each other the proper information that will allow them to understand each other's perspective before making any negotiations or strong points. The next step is to manage concessions. What are concessions? Concessions are a form of communication that signal to the other party the relative importance of each issue being negotiated. It also symbolizes each party's motivation to bargain in a good faith. These are necessary for party to move towards an area of agreement. However, it is important to take note that they should be offered in smaller installments for a higher chance of positive emotions and outcomes. In this case, Karen can offer something small in exchange for Louise helping her in need, even though Louise is frustrated with her. Next step is to manage time. Negotiators tend to make more concessions as the deadline gets closer. This can be more of a risky liability if you are under time pressure, or it can be an advantage if the other party alone is under time pressure. Another time factor is that the more time someone has invested in the negotiation, the more commitment he or she becomes in ensuring an agreement is reached. So if Louis wants to have a higher chance at what he wants, he would wait to keep Karen until the deadline pressure her to make more concessions. But that wouldn't be very mature now, would it? Both Louis and Karen have responsibility of managing their time. Next is building the relationship. Building and maintaining trust is important in all negotiations. Trust keeps party on the issue rather than on the personalities. This motivates both parties to return to the bargain table when negotiations sometimes stall and can encourage party to engage in future negotiations. Thus, so while Karen and Louis negotiate, they have to make sure not to get political and start attacking each other personally if things go wrong. They both are co-workers who have a huge impact on, on the company. If they ruin their relationship, productivity would go down and negatively affect their environment. Lastly, we address the location setting. When negotiating about issue, who is your audience? Is it really appropriate to have a heated discussion in front of everybody? Or can the conversation be simply moved to a couple people in conference room? Be smart about where you hold your negotiation and who you invite to participate or listen. Sometimes it is not everyone's business other than the final decision being made. Be sure to keep any stress to a minimum level in order not to create office politics or confusion among others. Now, let's take a look at Louise and Karen in their negotiation, where the bargaining zone model of negotiations will be applied. Finally, we will be addressing Karen and Louise's conflict with John. Here we have Karen and Louise ready to negotiate using the bargaining zone model of negotiations. There are two sides to the area of potential agreement, which is where we want to reach. Two parties start with their initial point where each party's opening offer marks the beginning of the negotiation. Here we have Louis's initial point of wanting Karen's job. He helped her since the beginning and the least she could do is give him the credit he deserves. 
On the other side, we have Karen's initial point. Currently, she is overwhelmed, overworked, and pessimistic at this point. She needs his help, for he is the only person she can count on to efficiently do the job right. However, they both must be cautious that if their initial points are set higher than expected by the other party, for it can create an uneven balance where one side reaches their target point while forcing the other to lower their resistance point. As they move along their initial negotiation, they must have their own target points set and defined. These target points are their realistic goals or expectations that they can eventually come to a final agreement. This particular position must consider alternative strategies to achieve those objectives and test the underlying assumptions about the situation. It is important to remember that negotiators with high specific target points will usually obtain better outcomes. Here, Lewis's target point is to fix their damage relationship at work and coexist as equals, while working on equally intensive duties with equal status. On the other side, Karen's target point is to not lose her job and make the best of her current work challenges, which one would say is a more effective target point. Who has a better shot so far at having a more successful outcome? Right now, it appears that Lewis has stronger intentions and has a lot more drive to get what he needs. However, Karen has more power so it can be hard to have a win-win with a power distance between them. So let's not assume anything for now. Finally, when they begin to reach a potential agreement like a promotion and reward for helping out with overload of work, there can be a huge gray area where things can get tense. This is known as the area of potential agreement, where there is a lot of room for solutions as well as mistakes. For example, each side has their own interpretations of a coherent agreement. So this area is rather large and contains a resistance point for each side to work out. The resistance point in the bargaining zone model is the point beyond which you will make no further concessions. But how do you determine the resistance point? Is the point beyond which you walk away from the negotiations? You must look at the best alternative to a negotiated settlement. This is the best outcome you might achieve through some other course of action if you abandon the current negotiation. This represents that cost if you walk away from negotiations. Would it be smart for Karen or Lewis to walk away from it? It can have serious impact on both sides if either side decides that negotiating isn't worth it. Karen and Lewis have reached the negotiation table with their CEO present. Karen during the negotiation states that the job role might be too much and Simi regrets taking the promotion. On the other side, Lewis is upset because he states he wanted all those extra responsibilities and pay despite him going out of his way to assist Karen. As Karen develops her argument, she is frustrated, overwhelmed, and quite unhappy. Her main concern is that she does not want to lose her job, but wants to make the best out of her current challenges. Let's turn to Lewis, whose initial point is wanting the current job Karen has. While he wants to fix her damaged work relationship, he wants some form of cohesion where they both get what they want. Here is where we reach the area of potential agreement. This is what can happen as suggested by the CEO. Karen and Lewis could split up their job roles and each take on half of the responsibilities. This interpretation concerns both sides and we now reach some resistance points. Karen does not want to be demoted, lose all her pay, and lose her recognition. In addition, Lewis wants something out of this that benefits him at the same level of Karen, or else he would find another job. Without him, productivity would remain at risk. However, the CEO explained that being both directors with the same power, levels of responsibility, and accountability will allow a feasible solution. However, they will have to split the pay raise initially given to Karen. No one loses their pay before the promotion. Role recognition is given and more fair outcome is created. This would be the most realistic solution in a business situation, a rather complex scenario, but there are important takeaways to understand. Let's recap, shall we? Effective negotiators engage in several preparation activities that include determining their initial target and resistance positions. When you're eventually negotiating in the workplace, you need to be effective by devoting more attention to gathering than giving information. Focus on the other party's underlying needs. Remember, you want this to be a win-win if possible. You cannot resolve disagreements unless you know what you want, why you want it, and what power you have to get it. Remember, this is not an obscure practice reserved for labor and management bosses. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.